or energy changes, we're going to have to talk about enthalpy, delta H of reactions. These are known as enthalpies of reaction. So if we consider delta H of a reaction, whenever you see a delta, what are you thinking in your head? What minus what? Final minus initial, let's turn that into something more chemical. What is the final state of a chemical reaction? Yeah, you get to your products. So you have H products minus H. What's the initial state of a chemical reaction? Yeah, reactants. Now, the delta H reaction is less than zero. We can have two situations where delta H reaction is greater than zero. What do we know about the heat exchange of this reaction? If delta H reaction is less than zero, is this an exothermic or endothermic reaction? Yep. We have an exothermic reaction. And if delta H is greater than zero, you have an endothermic reaction. So let's consider melting of ice. So we're going from H2O solid to H2O liquid. If you look up the delta H of the reaction, the magnitude is equal to 6.01 kilojoules per mole. What about the sign? Is this going to be an endothermic process or an exothermic process? Does ice need to take in energy or give off energy? to become a liquid. Endothermic, it has to take in energy to go from this point to this point. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does, it makes complete sense, right? What happens to the distance between the molecules or what happens with the motion of the molecules? Which, which has more motion in it, the liquid or the solid? The liquid, the molecules are vibrating around a lot. So in this case, we should have a positive sign, right? We have to put in energy into our system. Yeah. Yep, that's 6.01 kilojoules per mole. Now, let's say we consider the opposite reaction. We, we look at uh, the freezing of water. So we go from H2O liquid to H2O solid. Is this process going to be endo or exothermic? Yeah, exothermic, right? It's going to have to give off energy. These molecules are all wiggling around and we want them to slow down. We don't want them to wiggle as much, right? So they start to condense and form a solid. It's, it's like a bunch of kids, like at a, at a, a little kid uh, birthday party, like they're, they get all shoved up, they're running around, acting all crazy and stuff. And eventually they just hit a wall, right? And you can watch the wall happen. Things, toys start getting thrown, the energy starts going down in the room and they quit moving for a little bit. So what about the sign? We said it's endo. Or did we said it was exo, right? What did we say? Endo or exo for this one? Exo, right? We have to give off energy. What should the sign be? Anybody know the value off the top of their head? Yep. 6.01 kilojoules per mole. How'd you know that? Right. What do you notice when we flip the reaction around? Does, 
Does the magnitude of delta H change? The magnitude's not changing, but the sign does change. That's going to be a very important idea when we start talking about Hess's law. Okay. Are there any questions about this? No? Okay, let's talk about standard temporal phase of formation. So when we make a product, we'd like to know if it's going to take in energy or give off energy if we want to make that product, right? To help us figure out P. It can help us figure out the reaction conditions we need to make said product. So a standard enthalpy of formation. The symbol we're going to give it is delta H sub F naught. And that little naught symbol, does anybody know what it means? Any ideas? It means a standard state. So if we're talking about enthalpy, we have a constant what? What property is going to be constant to get to an enthalpy? Constant pressure, right? So if we're talking about a standard enthalpy of formation, can you guess which property is going to remain constant? Pressure. And what, what we could do this at any state, but we're going to say we're, we're going to do it at one specific one that everybody's going to agree on. What would you pick? You had to pick one pressure. Yeah, one ATM. So the standard state is equal to one ATM. And also, we're going to keep temperature constant. We, we go with uh, 25 degrees C. So that's what that little, that little knock symbol means. It just means at a standard state. Because if we change pressures, we're going to change our enthalpies. Like if you conduct a reaction, at uh, one atmosphere, you're going to get a different heat exchange compared to a thousand atmospheres. It's just the way enthalpy works because we saw that pressure volume term being included. Okay. Now the downside is, is we can't determine the H, like just the enthalpy of the substance by itself. We have to compare it to something else. So that's why we have these delta H formations instead of just H formations. We can't ever know them because we have to measure them based off of something else. So since there is no way to directly measure the enthalpy of the substance, We set an arbitrary reference. So we pick a reference. To determine delta HF. It's not really that weird of a concept. We think of Think of Celsius, that temperature scale. We set the zero of the Celsius temperature scale to one arbitrary point. What, what happens at zero degrees C? Yeah, water freezes. What happens at 100 degrees C? Water boils. We set that temperature scale up completely based upon water. In this case, we're setting up uh, an enthalpy scale with a reference state. Now, what is that reference state? Like, what's a zero when it comes to enthalpy? We say uh, an element found in its most basic elemental form 
at STP, your standard temperature and pressure, standard state is equal to zero. So delta HF naught is equal to zero for any element in its most stable state. In its most stable state. So we'll look at an example of this so you get, get what I mean. We're going to consider oxygen gas and ozone. Okay. So, example. The heat of formation for O2 gas and the heat of formation of ozone. Does anybody know the chemical formula for ozone? Mm -hmm. Yep, O3. So of these two, which is most stable at our standard state? How are you gonna find oxygen? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you'll find it as O2, you won't find it as O3. If we found it as O3, it would be really bad. It would rip our lungs apart. It would be very good. So, what would you say? The oops, that's a crappy design. What would you say the standard enthalpy of formation of this O2 gas is? Yeah, it's zero. We set this one equal to zero. However, O3 is going to have a different value than zero, right? In this case, it's 142.2 kilojoules. So what would be considered the reference element in this case? Or the reference state for oxygen? Yeah, O2. O2 is considered the reference state. So this guy is a reference state. And you can look all of these up in the back of your book. There's a huge appendix that has a bunch of different compounds in it. And you can figure out what element or what is the elemental form, what is the reference state based upon which ones in the back of the book have a zero for their enthalpy. Okay, so now let's ask the question, how do we calculate this thing? It would be nice to be able to, like we can look them up, but let's say we run into something we can't look up. How do we calculate? So there are a couple of different ways to do this. Oh, right. Question, how do we calculate the standard heat of reaction from these heats of formation. So what we're going to do, we're going to consider a very generic reaction. Consider the reaction. We have two products, A and B, with coefficients lowercase a and lowercase b. They react. Get little c, big c, lowercase d, uppercase d. And what we want to know is, is we want to calculate delta H naught of that reaction. It's always what minus what. A delta final minus initial. We're in a more chemical scenario, so what's it going to be? What minus what? Products for minus reactants. So we got H F naught of products. 
probably should have put a summation there, sorry. Ah, that was terrible. I feel like the only thing I write that looks like what it should are those epsilons. That's a terrible epsilon. But we're going to go into products minus. where M and N are those stoichiometric coefficients. Okay, so let's figure out what it will be for our generic reaction. We have to consider the stoichiometric coefficients and the heats of formation of every compound. So delta H, not reaction, what's it going to be equal to? So we need a product, tell me a product for our generic reaction here. Okay, D, so we got delta H, F naught of D, what do we have to multiply that by? Yep, lowercase d plus what else do we got? Yep, little c times what? Delta hf naught of c. So those are our products, right? Now what do we have to do? Yeah, subtract the reactants. So minus, we need, what's a reactant? For a generic reaction right here? Yep, A, so HF naught of A, what do I gotta multiply that by? Yep, little a plus, what else? Yep, B times what? And that will get us our heat of our reaction. Well, the cool thing is, is you have a bunch of these delta HF knots. There's a ton of them in the back of your book. So HF naught of various compounds is in an, an appendix in your book. So of various compounds. Is in an appendix. In your book. And those are what you should use if we're going to calculate a delta HF or a delta H reaction in this case. Okay? All right. So let's talk about the two methods that there are to determine this heat of reaction. Am I okay to erase this stuff? So there's what's called the direct method and another method called the indirect method. Let's talk about the direct method first, and then we'll talk about this indirect method. So direct method. To determine. The heat of reaction. And in this one, what you do is, is you calculate the heat exchange, you measure the heat exchange for a reaction. You're making a substance, and the reactants are the constituent elements, the elements that make up that compound. So, four compounds. Synthesize by constituent elements.
So as an example, carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide can be produced from the combustion of carbon with oxygen. Produced from the combustion of carbon and oxygen. So let's write out the chemical reaction that's happening here. What are my products? What are my reactants? Will, tell me a product. Uh, um, well, that, that one's actually a reactant. Yeah, carbon dioxide. Here we go. Okay, we got two of them. And what's the form? How is carbon dioxide found? Solid, liquid, gas. Yeah, it's a gas. You can find it in those other ways, but we'll look at the gaseous form. Uh, how's, how's carbon found at standard temperature and pressure? Anybody know? Mary Whisper. Yeah, it's a solid. So, uh, comes in graphene. So, or excuse me, graphite, excuse me, which are made up of little layers of carbon, SD2 hybridized carbon. And those little layers are called graphene. So it's found as a solid. And then how do we all know how O2 is found? How's O2 found? Yeah, O2 gas. So this is the reaction we're considering. Now we want to calculate delta H not reaction. So the reaction at standard temperature and pressure. Okay. Delta H reaction. It's always what minus what again? For chemistry? Products minus reactants. Remember that help you. Okay, so it's products minus reactants. So what do we have as a product? Okay, so how many of them do we have? One times, what do we need to multiply this by? Yep, the heat of formation of this carbon dioxide gas. Okay, so that's our only product, right? Minus one times, what do we need? If delta H of what? Yep, heat of formation of solid carbon minus, what else do we have? Yep, delta H F naught of O2 gas. And what do we have to multiply that by? Yep. Um, it depends on if you keep parentheses or not. I don't have parentheses around this point. So I could turn it into a plus if I did this. Does that make sense? But I want to keep it. I like doing it the other way more. It's completely preference. Okay, what do I got to multiply this guy by, though? One, because there's still a one coefficient up. Okay, the cool thing is, is we can look these values up in the back of the book. I doubt anybody, is anybody carrying your book with them? No, okay, that means you have a life outside of this class, which is very, very good. So uh, I'll tell you some of these. I'll tell you this one, and you're gonna tell me the other two, okay? We calculate this, that guy right there, negative 393.5 kilojoules per mole. Minus, how many kilojoules per mole is this heat of formation of solid carbon? Zero. Why is it zero? Yep, exactly. It's in its elemental form. We know that anything found in its elemental form is zero. So we got zero kilojoules per mole for the solid carbon. What about for the oxygen? Zero. Same thing, right? Elemental form. 
Awesome. So we we do this reaction. What we measure is is this three ninety three point five kilojoules per mole. Is this process exo or endothermic? Is this going to give off energy or is it going to take in energy to make this reaction happen? It's going to give off energy. Does that make sense? When you burn something, does it give off heat? Yeah, it gives off a lot of heat depending on what you light on fire. Okay, so this is the direct method. But the problem is that sometimes it's not really accessible to have a chemical reaction like this happen from its constituent elements. There are some elements that are just not stable at standard temperature and pressure. They may react with other things. So we have to use another method called the indirect method or Hess's law. So let's talk about Hess's law. The indirect method. Hess's law, which these are kind of my favorite problems in general chemistry. They're pretty easy and they're more like a puzzle game, like a Sudoku, more than anything else. So let's describe what Hess's law is first. Does anybody know what Hess's law is? Your states? What it states is, is if you're looking at the heat of a reaction, it should be the same whether it happens in a series of steps or one grand step. So delta H not reaction is the same whether or if the reaction takes place One step or a series of steps. The reaction I want to consider is the thermite reaction. So consider a thermite reaction. Does anybody know what the thermite reaction is? Like, have you ever watched Mythbusters? They do it all the time. Uh, if the reaction takes place, yes, that's going to be an if up there. So anybody know what happens in the thermite reaction? Have you seen it before? Has anybody seen it? Like in one episode of Mythbusters, they used it to burn through a safe. It produces uh, molten iron, which is really cool, and it glows. Uh, one of my nieces asked me, to, she wanted me to make lava for her class, so I went in and we did this. We're going to do that. We can't do it today because it's too wet outside, and when it's wet, if uh, the molten iron gets cooled down too quick, it explodes and shoots molten iron everywhere, which is pretty cool from a distance, but from how close we need to do it. It won't work, so we'll do it Monday if it's not raining. So what you do is, is you, you get uh, some aluminum powder, and you get rust. You get you guys can tell me the name of this this oxide. What's the name of this oxide? Oh, maybe it's not going to run away. Yeah, if you, if you had to go with a more IUPAC convention, like you had to have the oxidation state, what's the oxidation state of this iron? Yep, iron three oxide. It reacts and you form aluminum oxide and iron. And it, it's such a hot reaction it produces molten iron. Uh, what's wrong with this equation? Not balance. Where do you want to put a one, Shannon? Okay, if I put a one here, what's got to go here? Two. Okay, let's balance our oxygens. What's got to go here? 
Yep, and over here. Perfect. Okay, but what we can do is, is instead of looking at this overall reaction, we can break this reaction down into two steps. We can have, we can look at the reaction of aluminum to form that aluminum oxide, and we can look at the decomposition of the iron oxide into iron. So let's consider two reactions. So it is possible to break this reaction down into two steps. Into two steps. The first step We have two solid aluminums, three halves O2 gas. They react and we form our aluminum oxide. I didn't give myself enough space. Typically, you have this on the same line. The delta H of this reaction is equal to negative 1,669.8 kilojoules per mole. We then have our other reaction where we're taking an iron, reacting it with oxygen to form an iron three oxide. So let's do that. Uh, am I okay to erase up over here? The other reaction, two iron solid plus three halves O2 gas gets us to iron three oxide. And the delta H of this reaction, I should have put it at zero, is equal to negative 822.2 kilojoules per mole. Okay, so we have these two tidbits of information. You can look them up in the back of the book. You can see this. But now the problem is, is we need to orient these equations around to add up to get to this overall equation. So we need to manipulate these equations. in order to get our overall equation. So we're, as a goal, we're trying to get to this guy. Keep note of it, I have to erase it because we just don't have enough. Okay, so the aluminum equation, do we have to do anything to it? Do we have to, do we have to rotate it around? Do we have to multiply it by any coefficients? Or is it okay as is? So look at, look at that overall reaction. Do we have to do anything to this equation? Is it the correct direction? Because we have aluminum oxide, do we have aluminum oxide as a product in our overall reaction? Do we got to do anything to this guy? Nope, so we can just write that one through. Got two AL plus, I'm going to be lazy and leave off the physical states. AL2 or 3. The delta H of that reaction doesn't change at all because we didn't multiply anything like that. We didn't multiply this equation by any coefficients. We didn't change the direction at all. 
9.8 kilojoules per mole. Okay. Now, what about this equation, the iron equation? Is it the correct direction? Do we have iron 3 oxide as a product in our overall reaction? So do we, do we have this as a product in our overall reaction? No, what do we got to do to this guy? Yeah, flip around. So we just flip, we can easily do that. We can flip this around. We get Fe2O3 goes to 2Fe plus this 3 halves O2. What is going to be delta H of this reaction then if I flip it? Opposite, because like we saw for our example of water, we flip, flip the way that that reaction was going, all that changes is the sign. So what is going to be the value of this delta H reaction? Positive what? 822.2 kilojoules per mole. Okay, now, just like with our half reactions, all we have to do is add these guys up. So let's add this stuff up. Does anything appear on both the left and the right sides of the equation? Oxygen. So what can we do to that O3 or that three halves O2? Yeah, it's going to cancel out. So what's the overall resulting equation? We got two aluminums. What else do we got on this side that has not canceled out? Yep, Fe two O three. They react. What is not canceled out on the product side? Al two O three and what else? Yep, two Fe's. And what we all we have to simply do is just add these two numbers up. If you do that, delta H of the reaction should be negative. 847.6 kilojoules per mole. Is this process endothermic or exothermic? How do you know that? Yeah, it's a negative value. So is this reaction going to absorb energy or release energy? It's going to release energy. It actually releases a ton of energy. And we'll get to see that on Monday, assuming it's not raining. Okay, next time what we're going to do.